Hello and welcome to this video on using confirmatory factor analysis after exploratory factor analysis. My name is Christian Geiser. I'm a statistical consultant and instructor with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. On Tuesdays I usually present tutorials that are related to multivariate statistical methods in the M plus software and on Thursdays I provide more general tutorials on multivariate statistical topics including topics relevant to structural equation modeling, factor analysis, latent class analysis and multi-level modeling. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also don't forget to check out the description for additional resources including a link to my weekly statistics newsletter and additional videos and workshops. In this video, I want to address an issue that frequently comes up um, in people's analyses of scales or questionnaire data when they want to find out about the dimensionality of their questionnaires, how many factors are measured with um, their scales, then oftentimes people apply factor analysis. And then one question that often comes up is, should I first run an exploratory factor analysis and that is then followed by a confirmatory factor analysis on either the same data set or on a random split of the data set such that I would begin with an EFA on the first randomly drawn half of the sample and then confirm, so to say, the solution that I find with EFA with the second half of the sample using confirmatory factor analysis. And so here I want to make a few points about why that in general is not a very good idea. So first of all, when you apply factor analysis, you should ask yourself, is it really necessary for me to use exploratory factor analysis at all? Because in many cases, if not most cases in the social sciences, we are not really in a position where we need to explore the number of factors. Instead, we typically already have an idea what we want to measure. We're not collecting random data or ask people random questions, but instead we have an intention with the scales that we use. Often we use already established scales or we developed a questionnaire, but typically with clear dimensions in mind. So in many cases, we already have clear hypotheses about the number of factors that are supposed to be measured with a given scale as well as the loading pattern. And so then we can test those hypotheses more easily with confirmatory factor analysis. Confirmatory factor analysis provides more powerful tests of uh, the dimensionality, the factor structure of a given scale when we already have an idea. When we're not quite sure, for example, sometimes we have a question about whether a single factor is enough or whether we need multiple factors, then we can compare competing models because we might still have an idea what a one factor structure for a given data set would look like versus maybe a two or three factor structure. And then we can um, compare those models using confirmatory factor analysis. So in many, many situations, really we're not exploring the number of factors or the loading structure and then EFA is obsolete, so to say it's not necessary. You can move on straight and just use your entire sample and run a confirmatory factor analysis. Now, exploratory factor analysis would be useful if you really had no idea about the factors, uh, if you have um, let's say a set of adjectives or a set of questions that um, are not um, that weren't collected with a clear intention about measuring a certain number of factors then it would be useful to apply an exploratory factor analysis when there's no a priori theory about what dimensions how many dimensions are measured with a given set of variables now what about the practice that people often use where they um, first run an exploratory factor analysis with a given data set and then a confirmatory factor model afterwards with the same data. That is problematic in many different ways because when you're using CFA on the same data set that you already used to explore or determine the number of factors, then you cannot really, so to say logically, you can't really test the factor structure that you that you explored or that you 
discovered with the same set of data because that would be kind of a circular um, thing. There's no new information in the data. You already use the information to extract the factors and determine the factors. And then so the attest in CFA is invalid. Fit statistics are um, not meaningful anymore when you already use the data for exploration first. So that is really not a good idea to use the same data set and first run an EFA and then with the exact same data set run a CFA. That doesn't make any sense. So say from a scientific perspective, the CFA then doesn't tell you anything um, meaningful after you already ran an EFA with those data. Now what some people sometimes do is, so say slightly better but also not ideal, is that they use a sample, let's say they have a, bit, a large sample of 1000 or so cases and they split their sample randomly into two subsamples of size 500 let's say each and so then they run an EFA first on one part of the sample and to determine the number of factors and then they run a confirmatory factor analysis on the second half of the data. Now I, th I would say this is slightly better than the option of running EFA and CFA on the exact same data because at least then you have so say independent data to run your CFA on. However it's also problematic because first of all um, you couldn't expect really to find out much with the second half of the sample because if it's truly a random split, then the only difference so say in that replication attempt that you could see between the initial sample and the second sample would be due to sampling error. So if really the factor structure in the second half of the data set uh, wasn't confirmed then that could only be explained by random sampling error and so that's not really very interesting in order to truly so say replicate um, a solution in a meaningful way you would have to see if that factor structure holds in a different population something where um, uh, the individuals in that other group differ more rather than just by random sampling error it's not a very meaningful way to replicate something or not maybe you could say not informative because then the second half of the sample doesn't really differ or shouldn't differ in meaningful ways from the first half since it is a random split so that also is not ideal and then also what is not ideal about this is that you would throw away a lot of data so to say for the initial training sample for the initial EFA you would only use half of the sample which may not be a problem if you have a really large total sample size but if you have let's say only 300 cases total and then you split your sample then you have only 150 for the initial EFA and so that may not be um, enough or at least you may have a lot of sampling error in your first half of the sample so the factor structure may not be stable the standard errors may be large fit statistics may be underpowered to reject a given model or to compare different models you may not have enough power and so the split then has statistical disadvantages as well because you reduce the sample size, you reduce the power, you increase standard errors of parameter estimates and um, you potentially make fit statistics less powerful. And so therefore this is also not ideal. Now what would I recommend? I would more recommend either a CFA only approach unless you really need to explore the number of factors or an EFA after CFA approach. That could be more meaningful where let's say you fit one CFA model or multiple CFA models and they all don't fit at all and you don't know why. So you get a very bad fit let's say for your CFA models and you want to figure out why is that the case. Then an EFA can sometimes help because it can help you explore those sources of misfit and it could help you for example detect cross loadings of variables that might cause misfit in a CFA model where oftentimes we set all um, cross loadings implicitly or explicitly to zero which is a very restrictive assumption and so then the EFA might show you whether there are any cross loadings maybe let's say you have a few cross loadings that are 0.2 or something like that or 0.3 then those aren't very substantial in terms of the interpretation of the factors but they might be large enough to cause significant misfit 
in your CFA model. And then at least you would know, okay, the basic factor structure that I assumed is actually not that far off, but I do have some cross loadings. And then you can think about uh, why that, why those cross loadings may be there. Another uh, option that you could use too when you find misfit in a CFA model is to try exploratory SEM, which is available, for example, in the M plus software where um, cross loadings are also admissible. And that is often something that can help when a model doesn't fit. So in summary, I would advocate an approach that is more focused on confirmatory factor analysis, at least in cases where you have a theory, you have some uh, hypotheses about what is being measured with your set of variables. In that situation, CFA is typically um, better suited to test those hypotheses and you don't need to run an EFA necessarily. I would discourage you from uh, running this EFA before CFA approach generally, and I would instead um, recommend using maybe an EFA after CFA if your CFA model shows a bad fit and you need to figure out why. I hope you found this video useful to learn more about factor analysis. Please don't forget to hit the like button for this channel, to leave a comment in the comment section and to check out the description for additional resources. And I'll see you next time.